An Analysis of a Perfect Day for a Banana Fish by J.D. Salinger, English 215 Analytical Writing. Assuming you have read the story, we're going to start off discussing the characters. Seymour Glass, the main character, is a veteran of World War II and has had trouble readjusting to civilian life, an understandable problem that thousands of soldiers have faced and not just in World War II, but in World War I, prior to that, and in contemporary times. We find out most of this information about him through the phone conversation between his wife Muriel and her mother at the beginning of the story. The mother is very nervous about Muriel being away and being alone with Seymour. She is appalled that he was released by the hospital, and she recounts a few of his actions that let the reader know that he is suffering from what we know today as PTSD. The mother is distressed that Muriel allowed Seymour to drive, and the mother says, did he try any of that funny business with the trees? Although this is not explained, the statement alone is enough to demonstrate concern. So did he aim for a tree? Did he try to drive towards a cluster of trees, any kind of thing, just it's that ominous sounding thing with the trees. The mother also asks if Seymour has called Muriel any more names. Muriel admits that Seymour recently called her Miss Spiritual Tramp of 1948, which also gives the reader the year that the story takes place. Now when we look at the term spiritual tramp, it's kind of an odd combination. Spiritual usually implies some sort of um, higher level, closer to, you know, God or some higher spirit. Um, tramp, of course, is someone of loose morals or uh, a woman who has been known to, you know, exchange favors of a sexual type for items like money or uh, in these days various and sundry jewelry and things like that. So it's, it's this juxtaposition of terms that really contradict one another. Muriel also asks her mother if she knows where the German book of poems is that Seymour sent her. And this establishes that Seymour served in Europe during World War II instead of Japan. Muriel tells her mother that there is a psychiatrist who is at the hotel who she has spoken to, which is another allusion to Seymour's issues. So, you know, what we're seeing here is a conversation between Muriel and her mother that really introduces us to Seymour without actually meeting Seymour yet. So from the outside perspective, in a sense, we're looking in the window, listening in on this conversation, we're getting the picture of a man who really is not stable. The most significant reference is to Seymour's tattoo. Muriel tells her mother that Seymour lays on the beach in his robe and won't take it off because he doesn't want people to see his tattoo. Her mother asks if he got it when he was in the army, but Muriel changes the subject. Political prisoners in German concentration camps, as well as um, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, um, anyone that the Nazis considered, you know, criminals, were tattooed with serial numbers to keep track of them. And on the right in that picture, you'll see an example of what they were done, um, how they looked. And uh, today, you know, tattoos are very common, but in the 1940s, most people who got tattoos were of the lower socioeconomic level. So again, what you have here is a family that sees tattoos as a negative, and then combining that with the shame of being a prisoner of war, um, you have this combination of issues where Seymour feels a certain level of shame, about being captured in the war. Now let's talk about Muriel, because Muriel is our entree into the story. 
She appears through the first few pages of the story and then fades from the story. Her role is really to provide the reader with who Seymour is and a little bit of his background. She represents the upper middle class wife who waited for her husband to come home from the war to resume her life. Her actions are shallow and indicate vanity. She paints her nails, reads a magazine, washes her comb, tweezed hairs from her mole, always something very sexy, and move buttons on her blouse. She represents, and in a sense symbolizes, the materialism of post-war America. She shops at Saks, she's wearing a silk robe to cover her sunburn, and she is very condescending about the people at the hotel implying that they are not our social class. So we're getting a picture of a family that's fairly well to do and that, you know, Muriel represents that upper social class that just wants to get on with her life. Moving on to the next female character that comes into view, we have Sybil Carpenter. And we are introduced to her when she says, Seymour Glass, said Sybil Carpenter, who was staying at the hotel with her mother. Did you see more glass? Sybil is introduced as soon as Muriel hangs up with her mother. The transition is both startling and abrupt. Sybil's mother is putting suntan lotion on her shoulders and back when Sybil asks her mother this question. Sybil's mother doesn't understand the reference to Seymour, i.e. see more, and sends her to the beach. Salinger clues us in to Sybil's youth and innocence with this description. Mrs. Carpenter was putting Sentan oil on Sybil's shoulders, spreading it down over the delicate wing-like blades of her back. Sybil was sitting insecurely on a huge inflated beach ball, facing the ocean. She was wearing a canary yellow two-piece bathing suit one piece of which she would not actually be needing for another nine or ten years. Wing-like blades of her back meant to give the impression of an angel or purity, innocence, and a canary yellow two-piece bathing suit, one piece she will not actually need for another nine or ten years. This is to let us know, and again, what Salinger does is he clues us in. He doesn't hit us over the head with facts. He's cluing us in that Sybil is at most four or five years old, meaning she wouldn't need the top of her bikini until puberty hits. Sybil's mother goes to the bar with a friend for a martini, and Sybil is set free to explore, and she runs off to find Seymour Glass. Based on their conversation, it is clear that this is not their first meeting. Sybil knows Muriel, calling her the lady, and Seymour says that he was waiting for Sybil before going in the water. Seymour admires Sybil's blue bathing suit, and she corrects him that it is yellow, which he brushes off as a joke. So why the color blue? Well, the color blue in literature often symbolizes innocence. Sybil's bathing suit may literally be yellow, but Seymour can see more and perceives Sybil's essential innocence. Seymour's own bathing suit is royal blue. Muriel's coat from which she had the padding taken out is also blue. As the padding is taken out though, this implies that she is less innocent. And Seymour and Sybil swim in the blue Atlantic. So you have these myriad of references to the color blue throughout the story and it is again the reader's job to look for these references and begin to understand them. The key with literature is to remember that it is a transactional relationship between the reader and the writer. The writer of a story such as you know Love's passionate romance, a Harlequin romance. Um, you know, that's not literature in the sense that it's going to be read for hundreds of years. It is genre fiction. You read it on the beach, it's great, you enjoy it, and you leave it in your hotel room for somebody else to read. 
literature has meaning it has depth it has layers and the reason literature is so important a hundred years after it's written is because it has so many layers of meaning that can impact a person as they read it and give them insight into the world in which this piece was written as well as in insight into the way a person thought at the time and into our own thinking how we interpret things how we analyze things because it is a reflection of how we see ourselves at times Sharon Lipschutz is mentioned by Sybil and she's another little girl and this is a reference to jealousy Sharon Lipschutz said you let her sit on the piano seat with you Sybil said Sharon Lipschitz said that Sybil nodded vigorously Seymour responds by saying he pretended Sharon was Sybil this gives the reader a creepy feeling that Seymour's focus on the child may be perverted and he could be a pedophile the tone of the story shifts from confusing to dread and fear for the child so at this point the reader we just kind of backs away from Seymour wondering what in the heck is going on with him Seymour quotes mixing memory and desire when referring to Sybil's jealousy of Sharon this line comes from T.S. Eliot's poetic masterpiece the wasteland from the first section called the burial of the dead the epigraph of the wasteland which is the first several lines that usually are quoted by the author from another piece of work and T.S. Eliot was famous for this um, refers to another piece of work and it's kind of like a um, an allusion to a story that's going to give you a preview of what this poem is about and this epigraph is from Petronius's Satyricon I'm not going to torture you with my Latin but the translation is as follows for with my own eyes I saw the Sibyl hanging in a bottle and when the young boys asked her Sibyl what do you want she replied I want to die so that's pretty deep so what does Sibyl represent the name Sibyl represents the Sibyls who were female prophets of Greek and Roman mythology their prophecies which emerged as riddles were to be interpreted by the priests the quote on the previous slide refers to the mythic Cumaean Sibyl who bargained with the god Apollo and she offered her virginity for years of life totaling as many grains of sand as she could hold in her hand however she reneged on the deal and he allowed her to wither away over the span of her near immortality as she forgot to ask for eternal youth as the Sibyl grew older she shrank in size finally becoming so small she lived in a bottle and when a boy asked the Sibyl what she wanted she would only reply that she wished to die so the allusion to death serves as foreshadowing for what is to come and again what we have to think about here with the Sybil is you know Sybil the child is a symbol and her relationship with Seymour is something that again at this point we're filled with dread and for those of us who know and understand the Greek and Roman mythology and anyone who enjoys literature it is your duty it is your responsibility to look this stuff up this is how we get to the meat and potatoes of meaning you know it's it's like being a private detective to truly understand what a story is really about that gives us understanding and really makes a story mean something to us so let's move on to banana fish they are the imaginary creatures that serve as a metaphor similar to the Cumaean Sibyl 
they gorge themselves on bananas, get stuck in a hole, and then die of banana fever because they can't get out of the hole. The concept of greed and self-obsession harkens back to the original scene with Muriel. Muriel's obsession with her appearance keeps her in her room, painting her nails, fixing her clothes. She even broaches the topic of dyeing her hair mink, which at the time was an allusion to a fur coat. Seymour isolates himself from Muriel by staying on the beach away from her focus on appearance and materialism. He spends his time with a child, which causes both a sense of foreboding and a question as to why an adult male would want to socialize with a four-year-old child. So then they go for a swim, and our sense of dread really escalates at this point. Seymour takes Sybil out on the float, and as the water gets deeper, he holds Sybil by the ankle. She claims to see a banana fish with six bananas in its mouth, and he replies by kissing her foot. This is symbolic of the Christian theological reference to foot washing. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples on the night of the Last Supper, and a sinning woman washed Jesus' feet with her tears to gain absolution. Soon after this moment, Seymour brings Sybil back to the beach and says goodbye. And this is the last time we see Sybil, and we realize that Seymour's intentions were not perverted. He's, a pet, he's not a pedophile. Instead, he is seeking some sort of absolution. So our fears and our concerns that Seymour are going to do something untoward or you know perverted are subsided, but now we don't know what's going to happen next. The reader is left hanging, literally, because now where is the story going to go? So before we move on to the next piece in the story, I want to just reflect on how Salinger juxtaposes the concept of proper behavior in society and the wildness of nature and how it's impossible to control nature. When Seymour and Sybil are out in the ocean, a wave crashes close to them, making Sybil nervous. Seymour responds with a line that would function perfectly well in polite society. We'll ignore it. We'll snub it. With this line, he effectively turns the societal graces that would make him functional in his mother-in-law's eyes into total nonsense, employing them against a force of nature that can neither be snubbed nor ignored. In doing so, he points out the ridiculousness of snubbing itself and the society that allows it. In other words, if you think about how, you know, what he's been through, what Seymour has seen in a concentration camp, what he's seen in war, what he's seen in terms of the violence that society has allowed, and the nature of violence, which you know, when you think about where violence comes from, it's part of our nature. We see that you can't control violence all the time. And to put constraints on violence with rules of war is almost absurd. And how the Nazis tried to organize their violence by putting serial numbers on people is as absurd as them trying to snub a wave. So then Seymour heads back to the hotel. He gets into the elevator with a woman he doesn't know and accuses her of looking at his feet. She claims she was staring at the floor and Seymour yells at her. The woman quickly exits the elevator as Seymour fumes. He says, I have two normal feet and I can't see the slightest goddamn reason why anybody should stare at them. Is this woman's rejection of a statement about his feet a rejection of plea for absolution? And again, we're going back to the Christian theological reference of Jesus washing his disciples' feet as an absolution for what he knows will come when they deny him in the gardens. Or is it a way of him realizing that he is no longer seen as part of society, that he's lost who he is? 
Based on his next move, it appears that Seymour does not feel as if he belongs in society any longer. So Seymour's last scene. Seymour goes into the hotel room that he shares with his wife and removes a handgun from his suitcase and proceeds to shoot himself through the head. The gun is an Ortiz caliber 7.65 automatic, which is a German gun manufactured in the early 1920s. It would have been something that Seymour could have picked up during the war as a souvenir, and a lot of American GIs picked up German guns off of corpses um, and brought them home as souvenirs, so it's not unusual to see these kinds of guns in the United States. Before we move on to the very last analysis, I want to talk about the sun because it plays a big part in the story. The sun is a life-giving force and it plays a large role in terms of sunburns. Muriel locks herself away in the hotel room because she has a bad sunburn despite using suntan lotion. So in a sense, she lives life to the fullest and is burned by life to the fullest. Sybil's mother puts suntan lotion on her to ensure she doesn't burn, yet she, and she doesn't, implying that she hasn't begun to live life yet. The woman in the elevator wears zinc oxide on her nose, indicating that she is nosy about other people's lives. Seymour is incredibly pale, which implies his life is no longer being lived. He is a ghost of his former self. He is no longer of this world. And that is what he begins to realize, which leads us to that last moment. So why did Seymour kill himself? And what's up with that banana fish illusion? So remember that the banana fish gorge themselves until they die. So you can then interpret Seymour's actions as having gorged on the violence of war and he cannot get it out of his mind. He is consumed by the memories of war. His connection with Sybil is his attempt to connect to innocence and youthful incorruptibility. However, even Sybil demonstrates the adult emotions of jealousy and lying. The fact that he never appears in a scene with Muriel indicates his alienation from his wife. He no longer feels bonded to her. He feels isolated from everyone. He doesn't care about post-war materialism or the desire to get on with one's life. And if you want to refer back to the Christian theology that we referred to earlier, again, he sacrifices himself so that she can live a more full life. So in a sense, he gives his life for her so she can live a better life. So when we look at this story as a whole, Seymour almost becomes a Jesus type character, a martyr. But we also see a man so consumed by the violence of war that he can no longer live in a society that didn't experience what he lived. And as a consequence, he removes himself from that moment. So, here are some works cited. If you have any questions, feel free to leave me a message. Or if you are one of my students, feel free to email me. Otherwise, have a terrific day and a wonderful week.